Hi, everyone. I'm Mindy Johnson. Thanks so much for joining us here on Primary Sources. I'm so excited for an incredible round today and want to welcome everyone as we get folks gathered. Uh, we are in for an incredible treat and uh, we have a load of things to cover. So uh, with that, I want to get started right away on our uh, introduction to our guest today. And when we think about um, the world of filmmaking, uh, her worlds have crossed from live action into animation. But when we think about our world of filmmaking, um, <clears throat> I'm going to make a bit of a what might seem to be a left turn here, but we find a lot of parallels in the world around us. Uh, there's a symmetry and a balance to the story of nature. Um, and how one part of nature adapts and works with another part of nature. We see this quite often uh, when you study the, a look at adaptation. We see this in nature where uh, a creature or being biologically makes the transitions to be able to be suited for the conditions or circumstances that it's in. Um, blending into its environment for survival purposes or being able to adapt to the climate around. And we could look at that, this idea of adaptation. I think the second definition here, former structure modified to fit a changed environment, not only works within nature, but also within our topic today, uh, the art of adaptation. Um, being able to work with fit within a changed environment uh, and sometimes that means going against the grain changing things up a little bit from the principles that we may know being able to adapt within uh, an environment that may not seem suited for an idea or a place of a being but we can also take in an adaptation we can take the original idea, the beauty, the majesty of that concept and transform it into something uh, entirely different so we can carry that idea with us, uh, even sitting in a tabletop somewhere. We can transform that to change in form, in condition, nature, or character, to transmute, metamorphose, uh, to to change or alter the substance of something in order to bring it to a new idea. Nature does that all around us, this idea of transformation and transition into something new and different. And we have examples of that in every way that we look around our world. And as being able to take that transformation and extend it into further ideas with uh, technology and then transforming it into something entirely new and different than what we might perceive in another way. So again, bringing it full circle to adaptation in terms of storytelling, something produced by adapting, adjustment in what we're talking about today. As storytellers, taking some of the great classic stories that we've known and loved for centuries and transforming them through adaptation, finding the essence of those stories and the magic within the written word that sparks our imagination and takes us to places beyond what would be as part of our everyday reality, the world of dragons and knights and other realms. There's incredible power in storytelling and in our imagination, but the ability to transform that into an experience that we know through cinema takes a special approach and being able to convey those stories so that the audience can be taken right along in those journeys um, is pretty unique and our guest today is someone who's quite adept at this um, throughout her incredible career in filmmaking taking some of our great classic stories and adapting them through a transformation into cinematic experiences. She's worked with many of the top studios and has transformed how we see and experience film as well. So it is my great honor to welcome to Primary Sources today the incomparable Bonnie Arnold. Bonnie, thank you so much for joining us today. 
this is your cue to get your camera on and we are going to get underway. <laughs> Welcome, Bonnie. There we go. Hopefully you can see me now. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. Oh, good to be here. Good to be here. Thanks, Mindy. You... Thank you, Tina. Thank you for all oh, for having me. Thanks, Matt, for running the running the IT. <laughs> <laughs> Keep together here. It is, uh, you have had an incredible career. Academy Award nominations, um, an accomplished producer in almost every genre. Uh, global revenues for your films have surpassed the multi-billion mark. And, uh, and you've also launched some of the most popular franchises uh, in the industry today. And then co-president of features for DreamWorks Animation and really overseeing some impressive slates. So, um, <laughs> incredible work. What, what, Thank you. How do you, how do you even <laughs> get <laughs> times? Um, I don't know, it's cause, you know, I don't know where the time has gone. I've been thinking about that a lot, actually. <laughs> how quickly the time goes, Flies packed a lot in. Quickly with amazing films, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, well, you know, you started, what few people realize, we know you from your work, certainly, in animation, but few people realize you started your career in live action. Um, now, you were uh, from Atlanta, Georgia. Yep. How, uh, how did you get started in this idea of film? You had worked in your... Well, you know, I, I have to say that, um, interestingly, I, I, you know, a lot of my colleagues in animation, uh, you know, when I first started working in animation, they all said they grew up on all these Disney films, the, you know, the old animation films, which I did watch. I mean, the Cinderella's and the Sleeping Beauties and the, all that kind of thing. But honestly, the movies that I really loved were the live action Disney movies, the, you know, Haley Mills and... Um, you know, um, Kurt Russell and those, <laughs> you know, those kind of movies, the parent, the old, the first parent trap movie. I mean, I love those live. I was a big, big movie fan. I just loved movies. And, um, you know, that's my, my mom, my parents would take me to, to the movies. We, you know, do that as a family thing. And I just love movies. But I think um, growing up in the 60s in Atlanta, I mean, it was about as far from Hollywood as you possibly can get. And there was no... Um, you know, if you see it, you can be it type thing. I mean, I had no idea how you, film schools were not ubiquitous. I, there were very few shows that actually showed you what went on behind the scenes. So I didn't know how to really, I couldn't imagine that I could have a job doing that. So I actually started out on a slightly different route. Um, I kind of grew up also during kind of the Watergate thing and um, journalism and reading, which actually comes full circle. I've always loved, I love read, I love to read. I grew up, you know, spending a lot of time on the weekends in the library and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And anyway, I decided to pursue a career in journalism, but who knew it would come full circle? Because I think I've, what we're gonna talk about today is I tend to kind of circle back around projects that have appealed to me that have, and you and I were talking, I said, sometimes they find me and sometimes I find them, yeah. the projects I've worked on. But a lot of times, for some reason, they have always been, or a majority of them have been based on original pieces of literature, which is kind of yeah. interesting. And I think the theme, you know, we're exploring what we'd be covering. Uh, the idea of adaptation really speaks to you personally and how you've had to adapt into, uh, first of all, the industry, film industry, and learning uh, as you're working, I imagine, on how this industry works in live action and then adapting as you transition into animation and then into executive roles. So it, it's a reoccurring theme in so many levels for you. <laughs> so well, I think, I think I started out, you know, I worked, I started actually out, end up discovering that there was this small but thriving film community in Atlanta where I grew up. And so I figured out how to sort of get myself on there. But um, at that time, again, I think there, I was not to say there weren't any film schools, but they were, that weren't, I had studied journalism, but, um, decided to get a, you know, get a job working with a film production group. But then it, it was one of those things where you sort of, you know, learn as you went, <laughs> you learn as you did the job. And I still think there's a little bit of that, but not quite as much as there, you know, it was back then. Yeah. So I just, you know, decided to put myself in, I remember the first job I ever had was with a. Um, I ended up getting um, a job writing the press notes for a project for um, which became um, this um, uh, a project for uh, PBS 
called American Playhouse. And I got to go on the location, which was in New England. Um, I was just out of college. And I flew up there and I went on the, the set, you know, into the production office. And literally the minute I stepped on the, stepped into the production office, I knew that like, this is for me. <laughs> this is what I want to do. And um, I just fell in love with it. And then I said, I'm going to do whatever I can to figure out how to work in this business. It was a live action shoot. And I got to go on the set and, you know, interview the artists, the actors for the press notes and help because my background in journalism. So I, you know, wrote up the press notes and, but I got to actually observe what everybody did on the movie set, the costume designer and the director and the, you know, but I saw what the producers did and I thought, I, can, I think I could do that. You know, I want to learn how to do that. That's what I, you know, again, it was like love at first sight. Oh my gosh. Well, and you're you know, starting in publicity that I share that bond as well. And it, it does, it gives you sort of a, a bird's eye view of everything. Uh, but how you know, fortuitous and perfect timing and being able to recognize this is where I need to be. And then mm -hmm. beginning that adaptation to, to get you on track. So from your work in as a publicist and working in publicity, you then found your way and was that back in Atlanta where you were working? Yes, I, I started, um, I, I did the uh, uh, work, do, I did some promotion for a traveling uh, film festival from, through the American Film Institute. Oh. Um, so I, I you know, was able to meet some filmmakers through that. And I just, you know, but I really loved working. I just wanted to work in production. I, I don't know what, that, you know, I liked the, uh, the publicity thing was interesting and it gave you, like you say, an overview of what everybody did. But I ended up um, working with a, a local filmmaker in Atlanta who was trying to raise some money independently um, uh, to make her own film. Actually, she's a woman director, filmmaker, which was pretty rare for that time. This would have been um, the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And um, uh, so she said, you know, would you, you know, if I get the money, what would you, would you want to work on the help on the film? And I go, well, I really want to work in production. I want to segue from doing publicity work. And she said, well, we're probably going to hire a producer, uh, a, like a line producer, a person who is in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the, of the show, of the set, managing the budget. And she said, we'll introduce, you know, we'll connect you with that, whoever that person ends up being, if we're able to raise this little bit of money. I mean, literally, I think we raised that she raised a half a million dollars wow. to make this movie. And um, anyway, they hired a producer out of New York, this woman, Elaine Sperber. Again, another woman. I, I, when I look back at it, I feel like I was able to work really early on with women in, in, a, in, a, in a business that there weren't a lot of women in these positions. Um, it's hard to, hard to imagine, but that was the case. And honestly, I'm, Elaine hired me and she was like an amazing producer. And I always said, I want to be just like Elaine. And um, I ended up work, I ended up, I started working with her in the production office and I ended up being the second assistant director on the movie. I mean, literally this was a like low budget, non-union. <laughs> I did everything from carrying coolers to, you know, driving the actors. I mean, it was one of those kind of things. But I'm still friendly with Elaine. She lives, uh, she uh, worked in the U.S. for a long time, but then eventually moved, relocated to work for the BBC in London. And honestly, I, st I just visited with her last summer where she lives in, in uh, right outside of London. But yeah, I said, uh, I told her then, I said, you know, Elaine, my goal was to, you know, be exact, as good a producer as, as you are. And she was very sweet. She told me that I had surpassed her, which I, <laughs> I was very flattered to think that. She was amazing. She was just tough as nails. I love that about her. So, you know, there was no, you know, there was no job that was too tough. There was, no, <laughs> there were no hours that were too long. And uh, she taught me a lot about how to, but, but, but the crew loved her actually. The crew really loved and respected her. And um, she was amazing because she had to bring this show. I mean, I think we had a 21 day shoot a live action shoot were very difficult a lot of night shooting all these things that are very complicated in live action or are, are just challenging when you don't have a lot of money yeah. um but she was great i'm glad to be able to give her the great shout out today because she taught me so much role model like that it clearly has stayed with you and I, um again we'll we'll get to it but it seems like that's another very cyclical theme for you that you continue to move that forward with today's generation which is mm -hmm. exciting
Oh, well, thank so you. that really sort of immersed you in the world and um, kind of propelled you on your course in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, you were still working in the Atlanta area. Uh, yeah, I did it. I did. I worked on a couple of um, Atlanta was sort of a, it was an interesting place to be in that it was a non-union right to work state. Um, and it had a, and it was had, a, as everybody knows, one of the major airports of the, in the country. You know, they always say to, you know, whether you're going to heaven or hell, you have to change planes in Atlanta. So <laughs> it was, it was easy to, easy for traveling. And it was before actually even, you know, eventually uh, Orlando and Florida got big, bigger, but this was actually before that. Um, um, just interesting fact. Um, one of the, the Secretary of State in, in Atlanta or in Georgia at that time had a lot of contacts in the film industry. Um, and um, he was good friends with Burt Reynolds. This is again, probably predates everybody that's listening today. <laughs> but Bill, Burt Reynolds was like the biggest movie star in the world, um, probably in the, in the 80s, you know, in the early, late 70s and early 80s. And um, he was from Florida, but he was good friends with um, this, uh, the Secretary of State. And they, anyway, they ended up bringing a lot of Burt, this was again before I started working in, in film per se, right before. But he, all, a lot of the Burt Reynolds films, the Deliverance and the Smokey and the Bandit stuff that were really big were actually filmed in Georgia. So again, there was a small but kind of thriving film, live action film business there in Georgia at that time. And I tried, you know, kind of had, in, you know, made some connections there. It was like, you know, big fish in a small pond, so to speak. You, they did, there weren't that many people, a lot of crew, um, uh, studios and stuff would bring their crew with them, but they would hire a few people locally. And I tried to get myself in, on the list to get considered for some production job, you know, as a local, what they call local hire. Yeah. So that's how I kind of started. And I did, I worked on, on non-union, you know, non-union movies. And um, I did a little variety of jobs. Like I said, I worked in the production office. I was a location manager. I worked as, I worked, actually worked on the set as a second AD on a non, you know, which is a, really a union type job, um, it, uh, meaning you had, I had to kind of learn on the job. But again, I had this um, great um, union AD that had come from New York and I learned from him. Uh, he taught me all this stuff about what got to do, you know, how to run the set. And um, eventually, which I know you have some info, I mean, you have some slides on. I was able, this was in, still in Atlanta, I was able to get hired. The first big studio movie was a movie called The Slugger's Wife. Yeah. Um, um, now let's, let's jump in there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that it really gives us an opportunity to, to begin this, this. I know you have some fun visuals for. <laughs> this expanse of your world here. So um, now when this came about, uh, The Slugger's Wife, uh, this was a film Neil Simon, come on. Now, it, this was not based on a play, correct? This no, this was an original idea of his, actually. Um, but um, actually, the, the politics behind this was that co the Coca-Cola company, which is based in corporate headquarters, you know, a Coca-Cola was invented in Georgia. <laughs> and they bought, they had bought Columbia Pictures. And so um, one of the first things that they wanted to do was host a big production um, of Columbia Pictures, which is obviously based in Hollywood, in Atlanta, where I was living. And so this was a big deal at the time. And this was a pretty, I, remember, I think the budget on this movie was about $25 million. These days, that seems like nothing. But at that time, I think it was a, I mean, it was one of the biggest budget pictures in that time. It's like, or, you know, around 1983. Two, I think, or 83, maybe. Um, and Neil Simon was the writer. And it had kind of a stellar group of uh, Ray Stark, a very well-known Hollywood producer was uh, the producer on it. And Hal Ashby was the director. Caleb Deschanel was the cinematographer. I mean, it had really, and then it, um, Rebecca De Mornay, Michael O'Keefe were the stars in it. But um, it was a pretty big deal. And it was about baseball, obviously, if you can see from the picture on the, on the bottom of the cover of the thing. But it was, a, and it was like the circus came to town, you know, to Atlanta. <laughs> and um, I got a job working in the production office. And Neil was the writer, but he actually, um, 
came and wrote all the time. You know, he was on the set all the time and did a lot of ongoing writing on the movie uh, as we filmed it. And I felt like I was very lucky I got to, when I was in the production office, he would come down because he was writing a lot in his hotel room. We, we took over this one big hotel in um, downtown Atlanta. He would come to the production office and sit in front of my desk and like regale me with stories about um, just fun stories. It was great. I was trying to do my work, but he was always um, coming down to sit in front of me and chit chat with me when he was, maybe he was having some writer's block, who knows, but, or waiting for us to get the pages ready for, you know, to go with him to the set on that day. So it was really a, a pretty um, interesting uh, for, you know, for me, a, a real experience into a really a, a big, pretty big Hollywood movie, honestly. Yeah, very much. My gosh, sitting at the knee of Neil Simon and hearing these stories. But I think, Bonnie, that speaks beautifully about you, your openness, your, <laughs> your uh, willingness to, you know, jump in and anything that needs to be done and learning and connecting with people. Um, mm -hmm something that I think uh, is so key to getting a career started in this industry. Well, I think that the other thing was like, the, I guess about 80 people had come from Hollywood to work on the movie, you know, kind of live in Atlanta for whatever the period of time was, you know, a number of months actually. So I was the native Atlanta and knew everything. I knew where to go to eat and where, <laughs> you know, and I remember the, I just remember the big thing was like, you know, it hadn't, I guess there were a couple places in Atlanta it hadn't really caught on like it I guess what was going on in LA but every all all the crew wanted to know where they could get sushi <laughs> and that was slightly you know Atlanta was more like barbecue and fried chicken and <laughs> all things southern um but yeah. sure enough I think there was one or two sushi places and the, the crew would frequent them all the time that's great well <laughs> that's key knowing where you're you're uh, you've adapted to it and you're you're uh you were in the right place for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, um, as you move to your next project that you worked on, uh, was this based out of Atlanta? Or? Well, actually, the interesting thing again, the 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 um, the um, Secretary of State, his name was Max Clellan, by the way, and he was good friends with the producer of this, um, Jerry Hellman, who was actually the, a very famous producer. Um, it was Jerry Hellman and Saul Zantz, again, very well. Um, Jerry Hellman had produced um, Midnight Cowboy. And um, anyway, he, um, they were good friends. And the majority of this was filmed in, in Belize, in Central America. But they need, part of it, um, the opening of it was in um, Western, the, set, the setting was Western Massachusetts, believe it or not. But a lot of the states that, you know, um, in the north of Georgia and a lot of the states along the Appalachian mountains in the east look very similar, at, you know, uh, uh, in the mountainous areas. So honestly, that could have been shot anywhere. So because of the relationship between Jerry Hellman and Max Clellan, this, they decided to bring this um, to, um, to Georgia to film, north Georgia, actually about an hour and a half from Atlanta where I was living. And um, I got connected with it because a friend of mine they contacted who was really, his job, he was a really preeminent sort of location scout and manager. He, something happened, he might've been ill or something. They were coming to do a location scout of some locations he had found for them to see if it, it would work. That was a very common thing in live action. And so he called me and said, Bonnie, will you take this group of filmmakers on a scout? I'm going to, I've actually looked at, I'm going to give you a map and tell you all the places. And I had no idea, you know, who, the, <laughs> who was coming, but it was Saul Zantz and Jerry Hellman and Harrison Ford and uh, Peter Weir was the director and um, uh, John Seal, a, a well-known cinematographer, the production designer, the con construction coordinator. Anyway, it was like 12 guys and me. <laughs> and I was, I'm like five feet tall. The first thing that the producer asked me when I met him at the airport was like, was I old enough to drive? <laughs> Only because I looked, I was about, I guess I was in my 20s, but I looked like I would look so young. <laughs> <laughs> and I was only five feet tall and I had this 15 passenger van that I was driving and I had to drive those guys around the mountains um, in North Georgia for like three or four days while we looked at all these locations. But it was so interesting because 
we had all our meal. I mean, we spent all of our time together and they were really at the beginning, just scouting. This is before they had gone to Central America, even on that part of it. And so they were having a lot of conversations about what the movie was going to be like and the script and, you know, it was still in progress. And so, and Harrison was, um, you know, with them and it was just, and that was him at the height of his popularity as a movie actor. And um, it was interesting just to be, I guess, really kind of a fly on the wall at all these conversations when they were talking creatively in terms of my learning and observing how it all worked and how the producers talk to them and they talk, you know, how they exchanged ideas, I guess. I, I, I learned a lot and that was a really interesting. And then at the end, I guess I did my, I guess I was a good driver, <laughs> but they asked me if I wanted to, you know, work, be a part of the film. But the thing about it is, even though they would do the majority of the filming in the U S they were going to go film in the U in Belize first and then come back and do this part, which is actually at the beginning of the film. But at the end, this was going to be their U S base. They needed a base of operations in the U.S. So we set up this whole thing. And so honestly, I was on for the whole shoot, um, uh, the whole production. But I was sort of, you know, we had like a little remote crew uh, where I was in, in the northern part of Georgia. And then they came back at the end. And, um, and interestingly, Helen Mirren was in the movie. And later, she's, you'll, we're going to talk about it, but she ended up being in a movie that I produced many years later. Um, but I first met her here on the Mosquito Coast. That was kind of... So this was based on a book? Yes, based on this book by Paul Theroux, which is a very popular book, but it was pretty dark. And I think the, I think it was a kind of a, uh, Harrison Ford had all, always played these heroes. And mm -hmm. so I think one of the things was, and, I, and a lot of people thought it was going to be hugely successful. I don't think it was quite as successful as everybody had hoped. I mean, it's an interesting movie, but Harrison Ford is, I mean, he's the he's the star of the movie, but he's kind of a, he's kind of a dark character in it. A bit. And it wasn't as popular with audiences because they were always expect him to be very heroic and he makes these interesting choices, but it was pretty true to the, to the book. Honestly. Yeah. This is 86. So coming up <laughs> his success in star Wars and Indiana Jones and all of that, it was a, a real turn for him, mm -hmm. but in a, a powerful film. And, and yeah, interestingly enough, Helen Mirren as well. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of more or less the official beginning of your work with this theme of, of adapted material mm -hmm. uh, that transitions for the screen. Now, you moved from there to Mighty Quinn. This is about 89. Mm -hmm. and based on Carr's book, uh, Finding uh, Moabi, mm -hmm. um, how, did you, how did your involvement with this film come along? This was actually, I had worked previous to this with another, actually there's this one we skipped in here and I'm sorry, I, it was on my thing, but it, it was actually um, um, uh, a film for Columbia Pictures, which is actually an important part. And I think I may have skipped it when I was talking with you <laughs> in advance, now that I'm thinking of it, that was actually based on a book too. Um, um, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, early, but prior to this, but I met David Picker um, on that, on, on, on a project. And he was the one who actually, um, this is actually the first film I worked on that was, um, when I actually, after I had moved to California, after I moved to Los Angeles, but it was, um, uh, well, yeah, it was kind of, there was a lot of things going on at that time. But anyway, the point of it is I had met David Picker in, um, Atlanta on a on a on a project um, that he was producing. He was a former studio executive for Paramount, and he was producing a small movie, not based on a book, but a little a little project that he and his wife were he was producing and she was directing. A, a former casting director named Nessa Hyams. But I met him, and he, I got along famously. I worked in the production office, and he got asked to become the president of um, Columbia Pictures while he was doing this, this other movie. And he, he said, well, what do you want to do, Bonnie? And I said, well, I want to work. I, want, I decided by that point I wanted to come to Hollywood. I said, I want to come to Hollywood and work in Hollywood. And he said, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to, he was based in New York at that time. He said, well, I'm going to finish this movie that we're doing. And, um, you know, if you, if you come to Hollywood, I'll put you to work in Hollywood. 
So I felt a little bit like the Beverly Hillbillies. Sure enough, I, <laughs> I packed up after we finished that movie and I came to Hollywood. Um, but this movie, the, the Mighty Quinn was, so um, uh, again, I'm kind of, a lot of things were going on at that time. Right after the first movie that David Picker um, and um, oversaw for Columbia Pictures was, um, oh God, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the first, one of the first ones was, date, was a movie by David Putnam. David Putnam was a famous um, Hollywood producer. He, um, and he was the, the head of Columbia Pictures and David Picker was working with him as the president. Um, David Putnam was kind of this, this, the, uh, uh, the CEO and, and David Picker was the president. So they kind of, and then one of the movies was one that David Putnam was producing. Um, so he couldn't no longer produce it and then Columbia Pictures took it over and it's called Stars and Bars. And it was actually also based on a book. Um, so I worked on that with a, with a, with a producer, um, Sandy Lieberson, who had worked for Goldcrest, a big um, uh, product producing company out of the UK. They produced Chariots of Fire and those kind of things for David Putnam. And, and Sandy Lieberson was a U.S. agent who worked, who ended up going to work over there. Long story short, I did Stars and Bars. And then when I first came out to Hollywood, um, they were doing, um, Sandy was going to do this other picture in Jamaica called The Mighty Quinn. Sorry, that was kind of a circuitous way to get to this movie. But he called me one day and honestly, they had mentioned me working on it, but I was right in the process of moving to Los Angeles and I kind of turned them down. And I got to Los Angeles and got myself set up and was talking with David Picker, who was then running Columbia about maybe doing something um, with the studio. And I was kind of waiting for that to happen. Then Sandy called me again and said, look, we're having some production pro issues on the Mighty Quinn. Maybe you could come here for just a few weeks and help us out. And a few weeks, and I said, okay, you know, what, what do you need me to do? I said, well, we said, well, you need, we'll send you a ticket. We need you to come like tomorrow. <laughs> so literally I had kind of just came to LA and I literally, you know, dropped everything and I said, okay, I'll do it. And um, flew to Jamaica and a few weeks ended up, you know, a couple of weeks ended up being a couple of months. And um, uh, that's how I kind of ended up on the Mighty Quinn, but it was really an interesting, you know, it ended up being an interesting project. And that was the first one I had actually worked on a production that was uh, out of basically out of the country on location, a whole range of different challenges than working in the country, but kind of good experience for things that I did later. So sorry, that was kind of a long story of how I got to there, but there was some interesting steps it's that led to that. Exactly. It speaks to this industry and the importance of, of following through on those steps and where they'll take you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, well, I always say that also, you, you know, you have to, you have to know, you know, again, you and I were talking, I said, some of it is, you know, some of these projects kind of, it's, some of it is a little bit of luck, but also some of it is kind of making your luck and, and sort of being, you know, who do I, you know, who's on this project? I would always think, who does I, did I want to work with? And what kind of experience might that be? And I thought this was a great opportunity for me to go sort of, you know, out of my comfort zone and to pick up and go to Jamaica <laughs> and, you know, spend, it was kind of crazy in this little town in Jamaica, but it was really this grand experience for not only professional, but personal growth, you know, to go and, you know, figure out how this would all work. And, that kind of thing. And um, it was super interesting. And I think um, you have to be, you know, especially, you know, listen, the movie business is changing, but even at the time it was like, you know, I was, I thought there were some interesting chances to, it, there were some trade-offs, but there were some great chances and a great, like I say, great opportunity to learn a bunch of things by doing, by taking this. Absolutely. Now from here, you return back to Hollywood and uh, your next project, this is 1990, uh, the film mm -hmm. Revenge comes out this now this was based on a novella right uh, Jim Harrison here uh, yeah. we had it in Esquire magazine how did this um, your role certainly you may not have been in, were you associate producing on this one no, no I wasn't actually a producer yet I, I kind of was sort of looking toward you know kind of trying to figure out how to make that transition from working I, I guess I was really working in production and um, so responsible more for the schedule and the budget and kind of, I get to call it that managing of the resources versus creative management. And I kept trying to figure out how that, 
how you can make that kind of transition. But um, the opportunity on this one was sort of interesting. This actually opportunity came about because of my relationship with Ray Stark, who had, I had worked with on The Slugger's Wife way back in Atlanta. I reconnected with him when I came out to Hollywood. And um, he was always doing, you know, kind of interesting things. And he, you know, he told me about this project. And honestly, this is an interesting project for me because it was really, um, the opportunity on this was one, they were gonna film it in Mexico. But more importantly, it was, the job really was the assistant to the producers. They were a number of producers on it. And in, in terms of my trajectory, it was kind of a step back in that I had to take a pretty significant pay cut. I mean, I wasn't, listen, I was one of those people that was living <laughs> week to week, paycheck to paycheck, and um, trying to manage, you know, live in LA, support myself. And, um, but I would have to take a pretty significant pay, almost about half of what I was making um, to take this job as an assistant to the producers. But the two of the producers were Kevin Costner and his, um, his um, business partner or, you know, creative partner, Jim Wilson, Ray Stark, and um, two other producers and um, Hunt Lowry being one of them. But the point of it is, Kevin Costner's was, we all knew that Kevin was going to be a big star. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I said, okay, this is an interesting opportunity for me to work very closely with Kevin Costner. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the job, so I ended up, to, and I kept thinking, okay, I'm going to take this job. And, you know, and I kind of looked at my finances and I said, okay, for six months, I'm going to take this pay cut and I'm just going to have to manage the best I can. I'll live some of my savings and I'll manage and whatever, but it's going to something, you know, this is a good opportunity. And I think I have to say I, that was, a, it was one of the smartest things I, I had done <laughs> only because it led to two pretty amazing things that happened in my career. So one, um, obviously there was the learning and, and being able to work very closely with the cre creative producers on the movie and not be, I haven't really looked at it in this way, but I really, I wasn't as tied up with kind of managing the day to day of the movie, which I had always had been before. I was, I had six producers I was dealing with and I had to do everything from deal with their laundry to their whatever, <laughs> which was fine. But the good news was it gave me, I really got to spend real quality time with them and observing and things in terms of the creative process of the script and how that worked. And, um, it was all, and you know, um, Kevin's input and Jim's input and Ray's input and all, all, it was really, that was really fascinating. But having met Kevin and Jim, um, and it was a small group of Americans that had gone to Mexico and we were down there and it ended up being, there was a strike in between once we, but right before we were starting to film, there was a big writer strike. This was 1988 and actually the show got delayed. So interestingly, I ended up having to work much longer than I thought with a reduced salary. And I just had to kind of, I dealt with it the best way I could. But the, the, the fact is when we ended up going down there, uh, finally getting to Mexico and um, I got to, you know, uh, work so closely with Kevin that after that or during, that during Revenge, really, he and Jim were telling me about the project that Kevin wanted to direct. That was what his goal was to direct his own thing. And I got to learn about the Dances with Wolves project. And they asked me, um, uh, yeah, Hero, you know what? Yeah, Les well, Mohicans. Dances was. You were we, on the ground level for dances. Yeah, uh, so that was dances. And then the other thing ended up being because of my friendship with Anthony Quinn, which we're going to talk about later, he had optioned a book that he let me read in Mexico. Uh, that he wanted to produce, that he asked me, would I be interested in working with him on it, uh, The Last Station. So out of those two, out of the one project, two things that would be really important to my career came out of that uh, revenge yeah. and working on that show. Um, if we're working chronologically here, then uh, you got involved uh, working on Hero. You know um, what? I, <laughs> that was my fault. Uh, dances came 
but dances truly, came after revenge. So we got to kind of got out of order. Jump ahead and, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Let's, we'll talk about dances and we'll go back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause it was dances and then last, I believe it was last of Mohicans and then hero. Okay. Um, but dances came after revenge because of my situation with Kevin and Jim, Jim Wilson. And, um, they, um, <laughs> now how did this Michael, yeah, Mike, interestingly, so Michael Blake was a, a life, a, a longtime friend of Kevin. He wrote the, the novel, but they both, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened with this. I believe that Ke Michael had an idea and wanted to write a screenplay about, you know, uh, a screenplay of this story, this original story. But Kevin, I believe, encouraged him to actually write a, make it a book first during their friendship. Oh, okay. And so Michael Blake um, wrote, the, wrote the book and he did his own adaptation into the screenplay. But Michael was terrific. He was with us. The, I mean, all of, <laughs> we had a whole bunch of people that were in South Dakota for probably in, for like six months. And I was kind of the first person to go to South Dakota to um, warn them. They never had a feature film being shot there to warn them what was going to happen <laughs> and kind of try to figure out where, um, you know, where we would put all these people and how we would kind of make all this work. But the, the great thing was that I had spent a lot of time during the revenge shoot talking with Kevin about um, Kevin and Jim Wilson, the produce, his producing partner. And I said, well, I would join the team if I could be the associate producer, because I was looking to make that transition from really kind of what they call a unit manager or a production manager to a, um, you know, a real, get a real producing credit. And Kevin and Jim were, you know, gave me that opportunity. I'm, forever grateful to them for that. Well, and um, when you talk about all that you were sort of focused on with this film, it's, it just is hand in glove with where you had come from in terms of location, practical location shoots and, and logistics and, you know, uh, stepping into a, a place that was not familiar and being able to adapt directly and, and bring in Hollywood as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I had to meet with the governor and the, you know, <laughs> everybody to let them know, you know, kind of beware. I mean, they were, they were excited to have us, but it was, it was super, it was, you know, had its own challenges. And well, no, I Kevin, think one of my first tasks was to find Native American rodeo riders wow. who would be able to ride in the Buffalo hunt with, you know, with Kevin, um, who knew how to ride, bear, you know, ride well and ride bareback. <laughs> with very little clothes on. So, I mean, it was, you know, we spent a lot, I spent a lot of time making a lot of phone calls about that when I, when I was just, yeah, that, 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 uh, how do you acquire that other than just being able to jump in? My gosh. I know. I know. And let's set, set the, the plate here for this film in this time period. Kevin was a, a box office success oh. through previous films. Uh, but this was a bit of a left turn. Uh, uh, he's a first time director. This is a Western. Westerns were not the most, uh, they were considered outdated, outworn. You hadn't really seen, they, they weren't a popular genre at that well, time. Well, everybody was, everybody was concerned for sure yeah. um, about it, it. It was, it was long, right? It, it, well, I mean, I think that, you know, um, I think a lot of people in Hollywood were talking about possibly being the greatest disaster of all time. <laughs> But interestingly, um, I, I, you know, but that's what, that weren't, pe that wasn't people that were there with us. Right. I mean, I thought Kevin did, it was, he was a first time director, but I think he did a, a, a really amazing job of um, assembling a really, really fine team of, of artists, artists, you know, and artisans that knew, you know, knew what they were doing and, you know, wanted to do it for him and a huge camaraderie and for, you know, not a lot of, you know, a very, you know, small amount of money. And considering, I think at the time our original budget was like $17 million. Wow. 
I mean, that was like nothing. That's, you know, <laughs> and that was our original budget. Interestingly, and I'll make it, I'll tell you now, that was the original budget for the first Toy Story movie. Really? <laughs> for some reason, that made me think when I heard the budget for Toy Story that I could, oh, I can do that. <laughs> if we can do Dances with Wolves for 17, <laughs> we what? surely can do, <laughs> we surely can do this Toy Story thing. Oh my God. Um, but it was very little money to actually, the, the below the line, you know, we had to spend. When you and, think um, it, it was, film. and it was a huge scoped movie, yeah. but he had an amazing, you know, cinematographer Sim and an amazing uh, Dean Simler and an amazing editor. I mean, he really hired terrific people who believed in Kevin's vision for the, and I thought that was sort of important for Kevin, you know, that mm -hmm. all these people got behind sort of his vision for the, um, you know, for what the movie, you know, wanted to be, could be and whatever and and worked hard i mean six you know six days a week and really you know uh, the rain and the snow and every season you know every kind of you know weather situation and you know for for months on end and in you know in these in this little these little you know no you know the middle of nowhere we drive you know far distances every day to the locations because they needed to be in the middle of nowhere basically and look like it was you know the pristine prairie. It was, it was kind of, um, you know. Uh, now talk a little bit about taking, you know, what began in, in Michael's book and his, his written work. Yeah. Then breathing life into it to, it, from a, a cinematic perspective, the, the challenges that you had with, as you said, finding these pristine prairie locations and the buffalo scene out of there, um, just finding that many head of bison. They were uh, a rare animal at that point. Um, yeah, yeah. Getting well, I think, I mean, and, and again, I, I give a lot of credit to, you know, um, the team that Kevin put together, uh, another, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, like I say, a location manager who came in with Jim Wilson, and I give Jim a lot of credit, who was, again, uh, Kevin's producing partner, and, and Jim, and Kevin to do a lot of research. I mean, that's why we went to South Dakota. They had kind of the biggest privately owned buffalo herd, I think in the country at that time. Um, and that they allowed us to film on their ranch wow. um, to, to do that. And it was pretty complicated uh, logistically. Um, and again, Michael Blake was with us on the whole shoot. I mean, everybody kind of moved to South Dakota <laughs> for I think six months and we lived it and we lived it and ate it and breathed it. and um, you know, and, and, um, and it's the, and, and Kevin and Jim and, and, and Michael Blake were very, you know, concerned about making sure that we followed the story. Um, it was, uh, uh, and everything from the costumes, I mean, um, uh, Elsa, who was our costume designer, I mean, she, you know, she, when, I think we first saw, this was when they were shooting, you know, uh, movies on film, <laughs> 35 millimeter film. And you would get the sample of the film stock. And I don't, people don't remember this, but you'd have to buy the film stock or secure it, I should say, at Kodak or whatever ahead because you wanted to shoot the whole movie on the same stock, so. batch, like the same batch of film stock so it wouldn't vary. Uh, we did, so we did early tests of the film stock. And that's when we first the crew first saw what the movie was going to look like with the, with the Native American actors and Kevin dressed and in costume. And we did these, like I say, these film, these, you know, film tests. And it was pretty, you know, when I saw it myself, I thought this is going to be, this is going to blow people away. And people that were being naysayers in Hollywood thinking that this is, you know, could easily be a giant disaster. Uh, you know, anybody that saw the dailies, which is, you know, the film that we shot every day, um, they, they had no, they, you know, that, 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 you know, put a lot of people uh, in their place to see just how amazing it, it kind of came through. Um, but again, I, I give Ke Kevin a lot of credit as a first time director to have all the right, you know, people around him supporting him, you know, uh, through the process. And, you know, that's an easy, um, or a challenging transition to act, to star, to be the lead character in a film, and then to be directing. 
and the first time director, I mean, he stepped into the deep end and, and beautifully mastered it. Uh, talk a little bit about the choice to, to maintain a, the bulk of the dialogue is really in the Lakota language. Um, talk a little bit about that choice and the training process, the, the, the learning curve there for, for the cast. Yeah, I think the I think, you know, when the any of the cast that signed on, first of all, the Native Americans and the, you know, the other cast, we had like, I think we, you know, Kevin wanted certain things that were, uh, I don't want to say unheard of, but were a bit challenging. Again, we don't have a lot of money. A lot of the cast came early, I want to say as early as, you know, four, some of them as early as four weeks ahead of the time we were filming to do, um, you know, training horseback, you know, training to ride horseback training on the language, training on shooting bows and arrows, you know, you know, elaborate costume fittings. So, I mean, all of this was, was uh, built into the plan. And again, it was unusual. And even the idea of using uh, subtitles on the, on the, on the Deco on Lakota language was, um, you know, very different for, for, for as much of it as is in the movie. And a lot of, again, a lot of people said, oh, I, maybe we shouldn't do that. And, you know, that I don't know if the audience is going to buy that and this and that and the other. But nobody had ever really treated the Native American story quite like as authentically as this. And there was a lot of support in the Native American community um, for it. And ultimately, you know, it, it worked for him. But um, Kevin was very committed and very passionate about it. And I think, again, it was surrounding himself with people that were better at everything that, that, than he was at different crafts, but following sort of his vision and his ability to communicate that vision and his willingness to listen when people said, we may need to pivot on this or, do, you know, that kind of thing. Stick. I, I found that to be true with some of the better directors that I've worked with. It's the ability to hear other input, but to kind of you can't let that derail you completely from your vision of what the movie should be. You know, incorporate these interesting ideas that you haven't thought of, of people that know this better than you, but again, stay the path. What were some of the biggest challenges you had in helping, in, in helping the realization of these vision, uh, the vision that, that Kevin had on this film? Um, certainly, moving into a, a, the South Dakota area where mm -hmm. it would, was a foreign. <laughs> well, I always, I worked at, on a lot of the times I worked a little bit ahead of the, the crew, you know, and um, making some decisions that it went, I mean, at one point I know Kevin had this real, um, he loved the way um, uh, the um, Yellowstone looked. He had been there before um, and wanted to do, the, the, in, the winter camp there um, in Yellowstone, which was one state over. We were in South Dakota. This was in Montana. So I remember I had to go to Montana. And I mean, again, Kevin and Jim had pre-scouted this a long time before a long, you know, whatever, and negotiate with the, with the parks, with the National Park Company to try to see if we could, um, you know, what the situation was going to be. Again, it wasn't just finding a location to film at, but actually doing the bigger negotiations. So a lot of times I did a lot of the advance work. Um, but again, it would be spending time with Kevin and Jim and understanding what they wanted and me going to try to figure it out, you know, see how we're going to bring 80 people there and all of our stuff. But the point of it is it, we realized based on how the shoot was going that really it was going to be a big deal to have a, what they call a big company move from South Dakota to Montana, kind of, I mean, we always had planned to do it kind of toward the end, but the filming was going over. I think at that time, we, sh we ended up filming 104 days on the movie, non kind of nonstop. We only had Sundays off. Sometimes we even shot second unit on Sundays. But the point of it is we'd gone, we were going long. Again, it was the longest shoot at that time. Nobody had ever gone that long. Um, but we were trying to make, make it work. And in the end of the, at the end of the day, this is just one example of something that we had to kind of make an adaptation on was the fact that it just didn't make sense. And, and at that point we kind of pivoted and ended up filming the winter camp stuff in the Black Hills of South Dakota, which authentically, <laughs> that's where that was anyway. I mean, really, I mean, it, Yellowstone was way more majestic um, in Kevin's mind than the Black Hills, but the Black Hills was, you know, 
uh, it was a move, but it was 30 minutes from where we were versus, you know, moving everybody on a plane and, you know, you know, decamping to the, another state and financially and schedule wise and everything. It just made sense to, um, you know, do it there. So we did that, did that pivot, but that was something that was involved in helping them kind of figure that out. Because again, I was the, I would, I went ahead to sort of say, how are we going to make this work? And, um, you know, explore it and come back, report to them and kind of try to figure that out while we were filming every day, which was, it was challenging. It was hard. Everybody working, you know, like I say, a huge amount of hours and, um, you know, and, and still had to be, think, think on our feet and be creative. And, you know, those are the challenges of being sort of on these locations. Well, in this film went on to win, uh, it had 12 nominations, uh, went on to win seven Oscars. Uh, it was the first Western to, to win uh, the uh, Oscar since 1931. It transformed the industry. Uh, it it uh, broke records, box office, it, it and so much of it, it just changed the way Hollywood uh, responded to an entire genre, to uh -huh. the approach to how films are done. Um, it still is legendary. Um, uh, it's interesting because, well, first of all, 2021 is the 30th, 30 year anniversary of dances winning Best Picture. It's kind of hard to believe. It doesn't, it doesn't at all feel like <laughs> it's been that long, but it's kind of a, a, a a, a nice occasion. Actually, the 30th year of our filming would be have been this year. Um, and and uh, we were going to do something with um, Turner Classic Movies. But uh, unfortunately, because of things that were going on, they, you know, that got postponed. But I'm hoping maybe we can, maybe this year is our year to do a little reunion or something with some of the group. Uh, a lot of us are still in touch. And so, uh, we're very proud of it. But I remember after the movie, well, two things. One, I'll tell you a story about the, the, the weekend it opened in LA and um, but the other thing is after Dances with Wolves whenever I went to talk about either a, a talk about a job or doing it all people wanted to talk about was <laughs> dan ask me questions about Dances with Wolves for for quite a long time actually not this was even a couple of years later I ended up uh, talking with um, yeah this was after this was even after Toy Story believe it or not and I've met I met, I got to meet and talk with Steven Spielberg about coming to work at DreamWorks and he, all he wanted to talk about was dances with wolves. <laughs> he was so fascinated. <laughs> the, the imagination. Uh, yeah, yeah. But anyway, I'll tell you a really quick good story is that I was working, I was working, um, I had finished Dances with Wolves and was working on the Adams Family. And we were filming at what, what I, it, now I don't know what it's called now, but it's called Hollywood Center Studios. It's like on Romaine over in Hollywood, right in the heart of Hollywood. I think it used to be the old Desi Lou Studios or something. But anyway, I was living on the west side and I would drive every day to work down Melrose to work. And this was the opening weekend. I think it was November. It was November of 1991. It was opening. And everybody's a little bit nervous about how the movie was going to be. I had seen the finished movie and, you know, whatever. And everybody was nervous about how the movie was going to be received on the weekend or whatever. And I'm driving down Melrose, driving, uh, I should say, uh, east on Melrose. It was one morning coming to work. or I can't remember exactly what time it was. But I'm driving on Melrose and I just see this line of people <laughs> lined up on Melrose. And I've never, and I've been driving that route every single day. And I go, something weird is going on at, on Melrose. There's never a line of people on, because if you know Melrose, it's very, it's kind of, you know, even though it was slightly desolate at that spot, you know, over kind of, in, you know, in, in uh, Hollywood. And sure enough, I, I said, I got to see what's going on. And I came back around and I guess and there was this line, there was a, used to be, and I don't think it's still there, it was a movie theater in La Brea. I think there was an old movie theater on La Brea that was showing Dances with Wolves and the, the line to get tickets to get in was all the way up La Brea and all the way down Melrose. <laughs> and I went to the set for Adam's family and I go, you're not going to believe this. The line for Dances with Wolves is unbelievable. And so I spent the weekend driving around LA and looking at the lines. <laughs> I'd never experienced anything quite like that where 
that, you know, this movie that I was a part of was that, you know, uh, you know, such a big want to see. I was thrilled. Beyond, everybody was thrilled beyond belief. And the movie was, the movie was great. I mean, the movie was terrific, honestly. Yeah, no, it's, I, it's, an, it's a landmark film and tra changed so much. Well, um, to continue our, our journey of, of adaptations, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned you were then in production on The Addams Family. Um, yeah. And another really stellar group of, of talent on this uh, next project based on Charles Adams' you know, renowned cartoon. Yeah. And, of course, the uh, 1964 TV series. Yeah. Well, that's what I knew. I had grown up with that TV series and I just love that TV series, but it had also been obviously the a cartoon, you know, based on Charles Adams cartoons that were regularly appeared in the New Yorker, which were, and the idea, Scott Rudin was the producer on that, Barry Sonnenfeld, the director. And the idea was that this would really be the kind of humor and, and satire was supposed to be really, the, the intention was it would be based more on the cartoons. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the sense of humor of the cartoons, even though, of course, we ended up using the theme, theme song because everybody knew it. But um, that was actually a big, um, that was actually, uh, we ended up filming that in, at a couple of different places, like I said, Hollywood Center Studios. And um, we had a giant graveyard set that we built at the CBS Studios in, on Radford over there in, um, Studio City. I think that was originally the set of Gunsmoke. Yes. <laughs> the town of Guns, where Gunsmoke was for oh. years, but we built the whole graveyard set over there. We had sets in different places all over town just because it was such a big, it was such a, a major production. It's and one of those, again, one of those things that I did was uh, part of my job. I was the associate producer on that as well, but I went ahead with the, some of the team, including the location manager because they kept wanting to get an authentic house that the style of the Adams family house was kind of, I think it was, I want to say, and I'm not, I forgot the exact style. It was not really Victorian, but maybe something like, I forget what the exact name of the architecture is, but there were a lot of houses like that on the East coast. And we kept thinking we could find something authentic and shoot the exteriors there. And we looked and we looked and it just, again, one of those things we didn't work. And we, and I think I have a picture I'll show you. We decided to build it in <laughs> the facade in the hills of Burbank. <laughs> and uh, that's where we took this uh, crew picture, which I think you have, uh, that I dug up because um, uh, we shot the, we took our, our crew photo in front of the facade of the Adams family house that was in the, for a long time was sitting in the Burbank hills. It's a, a shame they had to tear it down, but uh, now, we, you, we scrapped our plans to go back east and shot it in Burbank. Once again, you're working with a first time director. I mean, Barry Sonnenfeld had been a cinematographer photographer for right right directorial. worked a lot with the Cohen brothers yeah and his directorial debut um and uh, you know as a cinematographer really very strongly visual in his work mm -hmm. uh, so what kind of challenges did that present kind of working to uh, work with this established material and mm -hmm. a first, first time director right right uh, to get this story and an incredible cast, Mike. I think it has. I think it's really important too that the, you know, um, that the, the the writer, everybody's in sync on what they are trying to accomplish. And I think Barry did a, you know, and Barry and and Scott actually Rudin, who had a, a lot of experience and taste, and you know, getting these done, um, was you know worked closely with Barry to make sure that he you know got that every day because he was working with very experienced. Uh, actors, Angelica Houston and Raul Julia, and um, you know, so he had to come in having having a plan every day <laughs> of you know what exactly was gonna, how exactly it was all gonna work. And things took a while. There were so many costumes and so much makeup and um, all these kind of things. But I do think the you know the again, I think I think having something like um, source material that people knew and, and understood, it, I think it makes it, it gives you kind of a shorthand when communicating with the crew. So, um, you know, I think B uh, Barry did a good job of making that clear as to what his, what he was trying to accomplish. Interestingly on that movie, um, one of my jobs was working very closely with the uh, visual effects, um, produ at that time, the visual effects, I guess it was the, the, I don't know what they would call it now. We call it the visual effects producer at that time 
but honestly, he was the visual effects creator. He's a visual effects supervisor, Alan Monroe. And I was kind of his production person, which at that time they didn't have a, per it, it wasn't known that they would have a, a person that was sort of like a, a producer of the visual effects, but that's kind of what I was doing. I helped man him manage his budget and all that kind of thing. And that um, ended up being something that um, kind of in a weird way, <laughs> qual you know, was a, a thing that appealed to Disney on my resume when they were considering me for Toy Story. Um, so little did I know that that would become part of that because honestly, I didn't know that much about visual effects. But Adam's Family was one of the last movies, big Hollywood movies that, was, that did not have any CG effects. It was right on the precipice of this big revolution with computer graphics for you know, being used for visual effects. So we had all the old fashioned, sort of what they call floor and standard effects. I mean, stop motion and some of these other things, but not CG at all. Yeah. And um, uh, it was managed, you know, sort of shot by shot. And, you know, we had Cousin It and Thing and, you know, many, this elaborate sword fight that, you know, um, the Royal Julia does. So, so all these kind of elements that, um, were part of the visual effects. I mean, the visual effects were a big part of the movie. And um, when I ended up going to Disney, they, they kind of assumed that Toy Story being an all CG film, that all uh, effects film really would be managed somewhat like uh, a visual effects, you know, a big visual effects film, which Adam's Family was. It's kind of these and kind of, loot, you know, connections to different from movie to movie it ended up being interesting. Now, when you came to Disney though, uh, it was initially for live action work. This idea of animation was just sort of a, oh, by the way. Uh, yes, it was definitely as an, oh, by the way. <laughs> um, interestingly, um, uh, a friend, uh, a couple of friends had connected me with the, with the live action group. It was when Disney was doing a lot of these smaller budget live action movies. And they were looking for, again, something that I had done, um, being a, 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 a unit manager, a production manager. I was trying really to get out. I was trying so hard to make this transition from being known for that type of thing to really having a creative, you know, being a creative producer. But it was very, very hard to cross that line, to be honest. Um, you're, you were either one or the other. You either came up through a creative path or you came up through the you know, I guess it's really financial path or managing the, the resources. And it was very hard to make that uh, transition. And um, while I, and, and interestingly, the person who is somebody that a lot of the people in the animation our, our industry knows was working for Born to Vista Pictures at that time. So I met a number of people over at Disney about this live action position they were looking for, like an in-house line producer, basically. And one of those people was Sandy Rabins. A lot of people know Sandy. Um, she's been around for a long time, producer, but she came through, she herself came up through finance and worked with at Disney. And she and I met as a course of meeting a number of people and um, about this, one, this position. And then separately, about a week after I had met her, uh, she called me on the phone and she said, I was thinking about you after, and I kind of, I guess I told her that I was interested in making this transition to creative producing, but I wasn't sure what the right steps were. She called me and she said, I don't know if you'd ever be interested in this, but I'm very good friends with the guy at Disney who runs, who's running feature animation, Peter Schneider. And I just think he would like you. And I know they're looking for people and you should go meet him. And I thought, well, I know nothing about, I mean, I know zero, <laughs> less than zero about animation. But I always said, listen, go, you know, what, what, what have I got to lose? And that's when I, I, actually, I was working on a movie at that time at Columbia Pictures, for Columbia Pictures. That's when I was working, that's when the hero movie comes in there. Okay. I was working on another live action movie at Columbia Pictures at the time. I had a long relationship with the folks at Columbia. And we were going to have a two-week week hiatus for the Christmas holiday. And I told Sandy, I said, well, if this guy Peter's around. I'm going to have a hiatus from my show. I'll come meet him. And um, sure enough, I went and met Peter. And he told me about two movies that they were doing. And he said, well, maybe you'd be interested in this. And one of them was, at the time, was called Simba. Uh. 
<laughs> and this was at, right after Beauty and the Beast had come out. So Beauty and the Beast was, it was, there was sort of this resurgence of interest in animation and things. And um, he said, the guy that produced the Beauty and the Beast is going to be working on this movie called Simba. And he needs basically uh, like an associate producer to come help work with him. And I told him I, I did not nothing. He goes, oh, we'll teach you everything you need to know. And so he had me meet Don Hahn, lovely Don, yep. who um, I got a chance to meet. And he had an amazing reputation. And, um, and I met Don and I said, and, and then I came back to Peter and I said, but you know what? I've been an associate producer. <laughs> I don't want to be that anymore. I go, if you have anything else that I can be, I want to be the producer. <laughs> I figured what if, I mean, I was, I guess I was, I guess I came from a place where I was working and I didn't, you know, I was, I was maybe, I was a little bit cocky to think, okay, I didn't necessarily have to do this. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell him what I want to do. Yeah. So sure enough, you know, we, and we had a good, Peter and I got along and we had a nice meeting, but I said, I just have to be honest. I said, and, and the honest thing he said, you know, the, the, the Simba, by the way, ended up becoming the Lion King. I just want to say that <laughs> they changed the name to the Lion King, a great, a fabulous, you know, movie. But the point of it is, I said, look, I don't really want to, you know, oh, and they said the commitment is it's going to take you a couple of years to be involved in this animation thing. And I said, I just don't think I should spend another two years being an associate producer. I'm holding out for what I, a producer thing, because this is where I want my career to go. And sure enough, Peter called me back and said, hey, look, <laughs> there's this other movie. <laughs> and he like, we, you know, it's, it's kind of with this little company up in Northern California and I don't, they've never made a movie and we don't have a lot of money to finance it, but it could be interesting to you. And I said, well, can I be the producer? <laughs> and he said, well, maybe, why don't you, he goes, it just so happens the guy who's directing it, he's a first time director. And I go, oh, I have experience with first time directors. You know, <laughs> he's coming to the studio tomorrow. Why don't you come over here and meet him? And um, I said, okay, I'll come meet him. And so um, it was one of those days in LA and they're very rare, as we all know. It was pouring rain. <laughs> I mean, not just sprinkle, sprinkle, like a deluge where like people think it's snowing, it's raining so hard. And I'm sitting there in my little car driving from the West side over to Burbank, you know, and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? And first of all, I'm gonna kill myself here on this, you know, I feel like I'm, I might as well, I feel like I was on the ark, it was so much rain. So I get over there and I'm, I come in the office like I look like a drowned rat from, you know, they make you in the, go in the movie studios in Hollywood, you know, there's no place to park. You have to park 50 miles away. I'm soaking wet. And I met John Lasseter. <laughs> and John was going to direct this movie. And um, it's so interesting because John and I are very close to the same age. And we had this nice long chat about all the things that we had in common. I mean, honestly, the thing, he grew up in California. I grew up in Atlanta, but we want, we like the same movies and we like the same TV shows and, you know, those kind of, all these things that we had in common. And then he proceeded to tell me a little bit about this project that he wanted to do. And um, so that was the beginning of what became, you know, my association with Toy Story. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it started out with this kind of crazy, you know, these, well, what if, you know, Peter says, you come and meet this guy, John, and I ended up flying up to, some time went by, and I ended up um, flying up to Northern California to meet some of the other gang, Pete Doctor, and Andrew Stanton, and Joe Ranft, and some of the people that were going to, the very small team that was going to be involved in it, but interestingly, between the time I had first talked to Peter about it, and the time I actually flew up to, because I was finishing this movie at Columbia, Hero, they did a test a little animation test, a proof of concept that Disney wanted to see before they were really ready to finance this movie. And it was, it's famously on the, on the, on the DVD, the extras of, of Buzz and Woody, an early version of them on a, on a chest of drawers talking. And they showed that to me when I went up to meet with them. And it's interesting because in, 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 for a moment there, I, it felt like the moment that I saw that film test that I was talking about on Dances with Wolves, where I said, this is going to be, this people are going to be blown away by Dances with Wolves when they see the, the realism and the authentic, uh, you know, the authentic take on all this and how, how amazing it all looks. When I saw that test of Buzz and Woody, 
I said, nobody's going to quite understand or believe what you can do in this medium. And this is going to be, this is going to be, this is going to change things. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, uh, this is something I really need to be a part of if I can. And so, um, I don't know, there was just some interesting moments that you just sort of think, okay, this is going to be really good. I'm going to figure it out. And I'm, you know, I'm in for the, I'm in for the ride. So, um, and you know. what a ride, my gosh. Um, you, it was the first film to really go all digital. In yes. The, you know, even post-production. Oh my God. There were many arguments. I kept, I was sort of almost crying <laughs> to the, <laughs> to the team saying, God, we have to change the editing process too. I mean, that's like, you know, people have been editing movies the same way for a hundred years now. I know we're changing it, how we're creating it, but they kept trying to explain to me, listen, if you create it digitally, you have to edit digitally. <laughs> and um, the problem is that nobody, no film, no feature film had ever been cut on an Avid before, which was just literally brand new out of the box. And, um, that's how we found Lee Unkrich, actually, who was an editor on Toy Story, who became, you know, a well-known and beloved director at Pixar. But yeah. literally, we found him because he was working at some digital studio cutting commercials on an Avid. Because, and we said, oh, do you think you could come in and figure out how to make this work in, on a feature? So, I mean, again, we, I just kept, like I say, I was like slightly sobbing, saying, do we have to reinvent everything? <laughs> just because it was such a challenge just to do the first thing and get the story right and and that was the main that was the main thrust um, well i think too it's it's hard for we take it so for granted it's so commonplace today it's how we see and experience not only animation but live action and it's such a standard technology today but you mm -hmm. know, really, that was a pivotal on the cusp kind of bleeding edge technology at the time and but but so many unknowns about it to be honest so exactly. many unknowns that we need to figure out. I mean, Disney was, you know, key to that. They had done some of their own, you know, exploring on their cat system, mm -hmm. but had never really been applied in this kind of situation. And for so little, so little resources, I mean, every day I feel like I'm sitting there counting out paper clips, you know, to kind of how, how we're going to deal with the, you know, managing of those resources. But I think the interesting thing for my, I mean, that was an original story. Um, honestly, that was an original story. And I think, Interestingly, in the creation of the story, I know you and I were talking about, I think John and the team tried to come up with a story that would utilize what they could, what they were able to do in computer animation at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anything, and it's still challenging, but it's so much, so much light years ahead of where it was, you know, you know, this actually <laughs> this year is the 25th anniversary of Toy Story, the first Toy Story release. Um, it's kind of crazy. But um, the point of it is they had to come up with a story. You know, they had done this thing, Tin Toy, one of their shorts. And they knew that a lot of those, you know, kind of graphic objects were much easier to accomplish in computer animation than anything in the natural world, humans or, you know, anything, you know, things like hair were, un, you know, water, all those things were very, very challenging and complicated. So they had to almost like retrofit their story into, adapt their story into what the medium could do. Um, and that was, I think that was sort of one of the big challenges. But again, I found John very, you know, um, open to share what he, wanted to accomplish and what his vision was and he was a great leader in that way and letting the people really you know hiring really talented people and letting them make everything better and, and but also keeping on the path of where he wanted the story you know to go um uh on, on this like i say uh, kind of on this pretty interesting interesting journey with with him along the way yeah. and disney Absolutely. This marked a, a big transition for your career uh, and kind of kept you in animation from uh, from this point. You returned, uh, came back down to uh, Burbank and worked yep. with your animation teams uh, and again, adapting <laughs> one of the great uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs classics, Tarzan of the mm -hmm. Apes. Yeah, I, I mean, I listen, I, when I look back on it now, even things that I'm doing now, I feel like I've learned so much from like I say, being attracted to 
you know, this kind of, you know, liter materials and literature, the things that people have written and how that, you know, kind of, it kind of appeals to me. This is one where in particular, as, as now having this experience and being the producer, um, one of my jobs as producer was organ, you know, coordinating with the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate. Um, his, I think it was the great grandson, yeah. Danton Burroughs was still alive. And um, although they had kind of limited approvals on it, um, they did, you know, part of, I had to have regular contact with them um, about what we were doing and what the status of things were. And um, it was very interesting. I got to go to his, um, the little uh, house that's actually on Ventura Boulevard that used to be part of his estate where he would write. Yeah. And it was so interesting and um, little things like that. And I, and I was, a, one of the reasons I actually took Tarzan was because I was a huge, huge fan of the Johnny Weissmuller movies and um, enjoyed that. And so that was kind of special. But I think part of that was actually making sure that they were, you know, happy with what we were, what we were doing and felt good about it. And, you know, because it, again, it was material that had been adapted many, many times, but never quite like, never quite like this. In this way, it's a problem. Yeah. First time director, one of uh, Chris Buck making his directorial debut. Yeah, and Kevin Lima, who actually had um, uh, had directed a feature. He said both of them were animators. Um, Kevin and um, Kevin had directed the Goofy movie, mm -hmm. and um, he chose Chris, who had actually was, had been his teacher, and um, uh, at uh, at school, you know, or, and they'd work together, but um, they were a great team. I just, I got along so well with them. I, I just enjoyed every minute and Phil Collins and Glenn Keane. And I mean, that was one of my highlights in terms of just such an amazing, um, uh, you know, an amazing experience kind of holding hands and doing it together, you know, just yeah. doing it all together and all over the place. I mean, in Paris and you, you know, ended up having a team in Florida and Burbank and pretty, pretty cool. And it, it was a conscious choice to, you know, Disney was known for its musical approach and, and the importance of integrating music into the films. Mm -hmm. This was a conscious choice. Uh, so you weren't going to have a, a character breakout in song, but the music was there to certainly support and move the mm -hmm. narrative forward, working with right. the Collins and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that choice and um, well, they actually um, went to this actually right kind of right before I came on, but they had sent the um, Chris Montan, who did all the music at um, who was over it was a supervisor of all the music at um, um, uh, Disney, uh, you know, helped Kevin and uh, Chris, we actually had an outline, I don't even think we had the final version of a script yet to fill to see um, you know, what he might do with it or what he thought about it. And Phil sent back, which I actually found when I've been, I've been cleaning up some of my boxes from <laughs> my collection of stuff that I'm poised to give to the Academy, actually. But the point of it is, I found this cassette tape that Phil had sent us, and there were recordings of like five demos of songs based on that outline. And they are, you would not believe how close they are to the final songs in the movies. And that became our tent pole for the emotional moments in the movie. I thought it was remarkable that he connected in that way and was able to kind of give you the themes and the, and the, what I call the tunes <laughs> of what those songs would become. And I thought, and, and again, but it was a back and forth collaboration. I mean, it wasn't like Phil just, you know, gave us that material and walked away. He would listen to what we had and we, and then he would adjust and then we would do some drawings and then he would adjust and then he would see some animation and we would adjust. So it was a, a lot of back and forth, but, and, and we did it in a different way, but it was a hugely popular and successful soundtrack of his. And, 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 and I think, you know, and that's, and that I've seen that movie lately, actually last year was the, yeah. uh, uh, and, uh, a Tarzan anniversary. Um, and Kevin and Chris and I got together and, and we did a couple of talks about it and it holds up amazingly. I mean, it really is still quite poignant and get a lot of families who love it because it's about, um, a family, you know, a non-traditional family, which, you know, a lot of people have. And um, anyway, people love that movie. I'm so proud of it. It holds up so well. Well, and I think that's a unique approach to the adapt this particular adaptation of it is that uh, where the Burroughs piece and other earlier interpretations are more about the adventure and the unique world of this man, the, the 
transition, the adaptation that, that you chose to do through Disney was really truly on a different theme. Uh, yeah. Separate yeah. Story. So, family. yeah. Well, it was one bit families, you know. Now they're calling it sort of co viewing, but that was, <laughs> that was super important that, you know, the, the, the family, the parents and the grandparents, whoever came to see the movie would enjoy it as well as the kids. And I think exactly. we definitely accomplished that. No. And resonated with a different audience, mm -hmm. uh, taking that classic story and, and bringing it to a different audience through that lens mm -hmm. of family. Right. Um, here we are with the team. On, uh, this is the premiere, I believe, yes? With everyone wearing their... <laughs> For some reason, wait, I'm going to... Oh, yes, this is actually the premiere in Paris. Ah. for the Paris studio. And there's Chris Buck in the center and his wife. And there's David Staten, who is running the Paris studio. I forget who the other two women are. I'm so sorry. I apologize. One of the women I know worked in the studio. Um, but yeah, that was in Paris. We did the uh, premiere there for the Paris. Again, the Paris studio, Glenn was based in Paris. Right. And he, um, uh, we had a whole team of, of, of um, artists working out of, the, out of the Paris studio. So we did a, a premiere in LA and we did a premiere a screening for the uh, kind of a, a crew party uh, for the Paris group. And, and Chris and I went over there to be a part of that. You made a transition after this film, uh, moving over to DreamWorks yep. at this point. And this particular project um, emanated, or originated as a, as a cartoon. Yes, based on a comic strip by Mike Fry and T. Lewis. Um, about animals that, you know, from the woodlands that sort of, you know, enjoy the, 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 human, the human world. Um, really, you know, a, a, fun, a fun project. I had met Jeffrey Katzenberg originally on the first Toy Story movie. And he had asked me a number of times over, the, over the, those, those years in between, you know, when I was doing actually before, you know, kind of around the time of tar before Tarzan, et cetera, to come be a part of DreamWorks. But this was the thing that kind of um, ended up um, landing me at DreamWorks, um, working on, with this team. Um, uh, there's uh, Ka um, Carrie Kirkpatrick and T. Lewis and Tim Johnson. Carrie and Tim were the uh, directors and Carrie was also the writer. And Mike Fry, who were the creators of the, of the, of the cartoon. Um, really, really fun. Oh, <laughs> I, I think a funny movie. Again, I think it holds up kind of well. Um, uh, Steve Carell was in it, Wanda Sykes, uh, Bruce Willis, Dear Gary Shandling. We had, a, we, had a, we had a really, really fun cast. Well, and this... Uh, and uh, very true to the TV, and very true. That's, a, that's from one of the premieres. I see Jeffrey behind us, me and Tim and yeah. um, uh, Carrie. But we're really true to the cartoon, for sure. Work closely with Mike and T and kind of the humor and the kind of, um, you know, commentary on the social you know, uh, uh, the social uh, ramifications of, of the suburbs and what we're like as humans and how the animals perceive us. I still think I'm still shouting out to DreamWorks. I still can't believe they haven't done a TV series of it because I think the characters are great. <laughs> and the commentary is still so relevant. Uh, maybe on the horizon, you never know. You never know, you never know. And you took a little time. I'm, I moved this into this time slot before we get to your yeah. great epic work. Uh, but you had an opportunity here uh, to continue on a, a project that you'd had in development for a while. Uh, oh, gosh. Yeah, this is, so I hearken back to my time when I met, I mentioned before I met Anthony Quinn on, this, on the movie set of um, Revenge. And he had told me about this book that he had optioned. He actually ended up buying it. Anthony Quinn, the actor, bought it from, in the middle is Jay Perini who is a professor in, uh, at, a, at, a, at a college in Vermont and a, 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 author, a book author, a poet. And he wrote a fictionalized account of the last year in the life of Tolstoy, told from different uh, people in his lives uh, point of view. And um, it was such a good story. And Anthony Quinn shared it with me. And he said, I want to make this movie and I want to be Tolstoy. And he tried for a while. And that time I wasn't a producer. And I said, well, I'd love, he, he and I got along really well. And he said, um, if I ever get this made, maybe you'll produce, you'll be the, you'll be the producer on it. But I love the story. And I especially loved the point of view of the wife. I thought that was very contemporary and sympathetic and interesting. 
And um, uh, over the over the years, Quinn uh, honestly kind of the semi retired could never m raise the money to make the, the you know the the movie with him as the star. And um, I went to him and asked him at some point when I thought if I'm ever going to really be create you know the creative in the in, in the in the kind of way that I would really like to, and sort of see if I can do something in the live back in the live action world. These are the kind of stories that I liked. I asked Quinn if I could, um, I asked Mr. Quinn if I could option it from him and see if I could raise, you know, he would be like a, a producer on it, but basically if I could raise some money or see if I could get the movie made from, you know, really and make it about, instead of about Tolstoy, about his wife, Sophia. And the first person I went to is Glenn Close, who I had met during the making of Tarzan. And she had a deal at Disney and she and I tried to set it up there. And it went through, I mean, this is just the, the, the sort of the, I guess the bane of, of bane of the existence of the independent producer. It just takes, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So we did this kind of circuitous route, but I ended up meeting a, um, getting introduced to a director uh, through a mutual friend, Mike Hoffman, and he loved the book and he and I met and had lunch about it. And he thought the same thing that I thought. And meanwhile, Jay Perini, the book author, and I had developed this relationship. And because Quinn had owned, bought the book outright after optioning it a number of times. It was sort of stuck. It was just sitting on Quinn's shelf. And Jay goes, you, Bonnie, you've got to get this. <laughs> you've got to do something with this. Otherwise, this is never going to happen. And Quinn is just going to, you know, it'll just sit there. So sure enough, we connected with Michael Hoffman. He wrote a spec script that was really terrific. And he wanted Meryl Streep to play Sophia. So again, we worked for a while and Anthony Hopkins to play Tolstoy. And we worked for a while to try to raise the money and find the financing um, to get it made with them. And even then, in the, in these independent films were very, very difficult to raise money and get financing. And um, I remember I was flying to, um, I was en route to Cannes, to the film festival for Over the Hedge. We, we did a screening, a premiere screening of Over the Hedge in Cannes. And when I landed, I had a zillion messages on my <laughs> phone, my smartphone. It was Michael Hoffman, the director, calling me saying he had met these, connected with these two producers, one in the UK and one in Germany, that were interested in helping to raise the money to make The Last Station. So that went on for, that was when I was making the transition between Over the Hedge and How to Train Your Dragon 1. And sure enough, about a year or so later, we were able to raise the money. And in independent live action movies, when you're able to raise the money, you have to go. And unfortunately, Meryl Streep, who wanted to play the part, and Anthony Hopkins were absolutely not available at that moment. So within a, within a week or two, we had to run out <laughs> and get Helen Mirren and Christopher Plummer to, to play the roles. This is on the location in um, just outside of Berlin to play the roles. And we had a go movie, which is kind of amazing. It just kind of came together literally like that. We had a lot of financing from the, uh, in Germany and that's where we filmed this. This is at the train station and these are the Tolstoys. So this is, the, these are the great grand, this is the great, um, I think he's the great, great grandson of Leo Tolstoy. And this is his daughter, Anastasia. And this was us on a, there's, that's like, if you can see in the background, it's a train. <laughs> this was the station where actually I got to go on, I was on the location for about 10 days. I was actually producing over, uh, the, uh, the How to Train Your Dragon 1 by that time. Just one minute at that point. But basically um, my boss, who was Jeffrey Katzenberg, said, okay, you can <laughs> you go over, take a week or so off if you want. The, 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 it was a small budget. The filming was about four weeks. But um, I, like I said, I had partnered with the, this is one of the producers I had partnered with uh, in the middle, uh, Chris Curling. And this to the right is Mike Hoffman, the director. This is us on the location. And um, again, just outside of uh, about an hour outside east of Berlin. Uh, and that's where we filmed a, a lot of it for Russia. It was, uh, so that was pretty, 
pretty amazing. Um, in terms of location, you know, since you had the financing, uh, some of it coming out of Germany, was it, did that play a, a role in? Financing? Yeah, part of that was, part of that was if you film it here, we'll help you finance it. But then a lot of the, the woodlands of, you know, in Germany looked very similar to some of the woodlands, the, 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 you know, the, the birch trees and whatever of, of parts of Russia where he, you know, he was outside of the, you know, the cities and stuff like that. But this is, um, Plummer? Christopher Plummer looking amazingly like Leo Tolstoy. Uh -huh. So, so quickly turning this and getting Helen Mirren and Christopher Plummer. I mean, that, that's pretty <laughs> impressive producing on such a short notice. My goodness. Yeah. I mean, I, like I say that, and I, I wish I could tell you that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really it was like the work of, you know, the directors and the talent agents and everybody kind of working together, knowing that we had a go movie and we had money and, you know, and, and honestly, I have to give a lot of credit to Michael Hoffman for doing a really writing a terrific screen. I mean, the screenplay was very good and he had a very good reputation with actors, you know, and, uh, so that's how we were able to get them. And uh, if you haven't seen it, I have to tell you, it's it's actually good. It's really good movie. <laughs> it's just cool. James McAvoy had just come off of, uh, he was sort of new on the map. and uh, I saw him in Last King of Scotland, and I told um, Michael Hoffman that we had to have him. for the, He plays the male secretary to Tolstoy, and it's kind of the pivotal uh, one in the in, in this situation, other than obviously Helen and, and um, Chris. And this is Helen Mirren as Sophia Tolstoy. She was, again, terrific, coming off her uh, role in, um, as the queen, actually, yeah. with the director. She's so pivotal in this film. She ah, so good. Incredible. It's really about, the story's really about her. Yeah. Very it's really about her. And Where in the book, interestingly, the book is more of a kind of a Rashomon story of Tolstoy's life from the different points of view of all these different people in his life. But we decided, and this is where the director and I were on the same page when he wrote the script. I was really, I said, there's the, the story I'm interested in is the story of the wife. Because again, in her time, she was kind of subservient to the husband. And I know there's a very interesting story there and he agreed and that's how he wrote the script. Yeah. And the, even the sort of the, the fact that you've isolated it into the final year of Tolstoy's life and, and yeah well that was the and that was the book author that was Jay decided to use just one year he had done all this research and you know do it a uh, one year of his life this last year of this famous you Tol know had at that time I think few people remember or realize the impact of that there were these movements of, of almost a religion <laughs> based on him and here she is trying not only to hold on to her husband but also where, you know, her own livelihood. Yeah. You know? Well, I think he was, he was famous in his own time. And it was also, also the time of that popular photography became, you know, even more whatever. And he was just, I mean, if you can imagine the paparazzi were constantly outside of his door. Every time he would move, he'd be photographed by all these people. So they had no privacy. And this was in, you know, first, the early 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it was very, had very many similar issues of, to, you know, people today, I think it's very, con you know, had contemporary issues that she was dealing with. It's, but she had no rights as the wife, right? She had like, you know, 12 children with him and he was, they were trying to disown, you know, say that the children right. would be cut off from the will. It was very interesting. a very interesting story. It's a gem. So I highly recommend going back and finding it and, and absorbing it because it's yeah. just a, a beautiful. And I'm proud to say both Helen Mirren and Christopher Plummer got nominated for Oscars um, based on their performances. And the movie was nominated for um, Best Feature from the Independent Spirit Awards for that year. So um, it got, it got, you know, uh, we, we actually showed the, we showed the movie to a number of companies. We, we had a hard time getting financing ahead of time. Again, we had to get it from, you know, overseas. We tried to get domestic distribution and people turned, they turned it down after seeing the film. But then we took it to the Telluride Film Festival based on the recommendation of one of the agents that we were, sales agents that we were working with. And the movie was a huge, and we all went, the Tolstoys went with us, myself, the producers, the director, we all went to Telluride, the film festival in, um, 
in uh, Colorado. And the movie was a huge hit with audiences and Sony Pictures Classics were there and saw people just go crazy over it. And they decided to come back around and buy it, you know, pick it up for distribution after they saw how people and respond, how the audience responded to it. And was it a good uh, return? I mean, that had to have been a little mind bending to be living in this world of animation and beginning a new uh, what later turned into an epic franchise, but but then stepping back into the world of live action. It what you know it was interesting. It just I tell you it just showed me, and I, and I feel like I'm doing that again, right? Starting it again now, but how how difficult it is to sort of produce independently. It yeah. is, <laughs> it's a lot of work, and I'm not saying I'm afraid of hard work for not a lot of return. I mean, I have to tell you, other than. If you're, you know, I feel like I was very fortunate that many things came together to make this movie successful, but there are a lot of these and they don't work out as well. Um, and it was, and it's hard to have them be profitable because there's so many people that are invested in, uh, you know, that are investors, so to speak, and looking to get money out of it. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's challenging. It's very challenging. It's hard to make a career of that, Yeah, to be honest. But a, but a return, a satisfaction, um, getting yeah. I was lucky I had my day job, I have to say. <laughs> Maybe that's a secret. That's uh, right. From there, in, and as we mentioned, you were in the process of uh, getting underway on a, a, not the, a film series, little did you know at that time. Right. Um, but it, talk a little bit about how Cressida's work came to your attention with this idea. Actually, it was through, it was, um, you know, uh, I was working with, it start, I was working, started working with DreamWorks on Over the Hedge. And it was very small amount of people there. There were just a few producers actually working. Myself, um, Aaron Warner, who was the Shrek producer, mm. um, Ray Soria, who was producing on on who was there. I think they were. She wasn't even on Madagascar yet. But it was a small team, and we would regularly review a lot of the things that would come in, books and other th things that you know, pitches and ideas, we, a small team with the, with the people that we had some development, a couple of development people. And actually the first movie is we only had the first book at that time. And Chris Couser, one of our executives had found it at the um, Bologna book fair, which I couldn't remember, um, and um, brought it in. And it was a story, you know, kind of a coming of age story of this little boy, Hiccup and his dragon. And honestly, in the beginning, Jeffrey was not interested in it um, because it felt like we were trying to sort of de determine, Jeffrey was trying to decide what was the, um, what was the uh, brand, so to speak, of DreamWorks. And what, what would the DreamWorks movies be that would be different than what the, it was DreamWorks and Disney was kind of it, right? Mm -hmm. And what would make DreamWorks different from Disney and How to Train Your Dragon being the coming of age story of a, a little boy felt like a Disney movie. And that's what Jeffrey's concern was. He just was saying, I don't think that's who we are. But en enough of us, including myself, really loved the book and thought there was something really interesting there and, you know, kind of advocated to pursue this. Um, and it was challenging. It was challenging because we did some, and, and I had not met Cressida at that point in the beginning. We did a lot of work on adapting the book exactly like it was, basically writing a script with a writer and bringing on some directors and getting ideas. And, but we couldn't hit, I mean, we would show Jeffrey Katzenberg and the folks at the studio, and it, it kept not being, again, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was hitting the target of what a DreamWorks movie needed to be. And luckily for us, we connected with, um, uh, through my, you know, um, with Bill Damaschke, who was the head of creative at, at DreamWorks at the time, and myself, just like thinking, okay, what, how are we going to do this? What, you know, what, how are we going to make this work? We connected with um, Chris Sanders and Dean Deblois, who I had known from when I had worked at Disney a little bit, but had never worked with them, mm -hmm. to come in and sort of say, ask them if they happened. And Chris had already agreed to come over to DreamWorks to work on something else, but said, do you think, you know, we talked to Chris and he goes, let me talk to my colleague, Dean, and see if we can, and they came in and pitched this idea that was, it spoke to the heart of what How to Train Your Dragon was, but it, but it expanded it beyond that, made it more cinematic, made it a bigger wish fulfillment story, 
and finally um, appealed to you know Jeffrey and the studio about what it could be in terms of making it a feature that felt more unique to what DreamWorks what they what DreamWorks would be. This is a photo out the front of um, of DreamWorks with Chris Couser on the left, who is uh, who was the creative exec who actually found the book. This is Cressa the Cowl standing next to me and her husband Simon, and um, who's her manager. And um, she made many visits. The first time I met her, I actually had to fly to London. We had changed the, in the book. Hicc uh, toothless is a runt dragon. Like hiccup, he hiccup and toothless are sort of the runts of their respective the village and um, toothless of his kind of litter. And um, Chris and Dean, one of their major ideas was that no, 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 no. If a boy has to be friend a dragon, it's got to be a scary dragon and it's got to be something that Hiccup can ride. That, that's the wish fulfillment of the whole thing. So we kept the, the heart of who Toothless was, but we made him, we changed him into a big, you know, a big dra dragon, very scary for Hiccup at first. So I had to fly to London for the first time that I met Cressida in person and kind of relay this information to her. And I was terrified <laughs> because her books were, you know, she was writing more books. They were getting very popular. I didn't know this person. I'd only talked to her on the phone and, um, she sounded, I don't know why, but in my mind, she would be, it would be Angela Lansbury. <laughs> That's just how her, but this is before video chats. You know? I never met her. I don't even think I looked up her picture on the internet or something. And I kept in my head, she was Angela Lansbury, but she's this young woman and I met her <laughs> and, and had all this jewelry. She was just amazing. But it was her and all of her agents from the book company or whatever, meeting with me for the first time. And but she, you know, she was really open to collaborating. And that's what's an important part of this adaptation process is, you know, when the author is actively involved and she always, listen, she never interfered, but always gave us really great feedback mm -hmm. about, especially who the characters were. I think that's what Cressida does so beautifully. She creates these amazing characters and this amazing world. She, it, you, in her books are not always the movie story I have found. But, um, but I think that's up to the filmmakers to create. I use many times, one of my people that I've worked with know I use the baking metaphor. You have, she gives you great ingredients, but you have to come up with what the recipe for the movie is going to be. You know, what is this cake gonna really look like in order to make it cinematic and work on the big screen and that kind of thing. But Cressida was very open to having us depart from some of her original ideas to make that work. Well, and I think that speaks well to you, though, as a producer working in adapting something to to get to the original source mm -hmm. and, you know, have her included, have him and whoever the, the author may be included in that process. Yeah. Well, it was important, too, to this to make her feel part of that process because she also had this huge following, um, especially overseas. And um, she's currently actually the Children's Laureate of the UK. So she has a big following of readers and, you know, that kind of thing. And literacy is a big thing for her. But the point of it is she helped us, you know, she, you want the author to say, be proud of the film and say good things about it. They have, you know, especially these days in social media and this and that, she has a huge following. And it was very important for her and her, her family and kids and everybody to be supportive of the movie. But they were, they, they were very happy with, with how it turned out. So, you know, she was involved with all three. Uh, involved with helping us with all three of the films, even though they were sort of a, you know, they rode alongside her books. They weren't exactly her book stories. Mm -hmm. Inspired. Yeah, that's me and Dear Toothless. Yeah. So you were talking a little bit about how uh, the form of Toothless had to, uh, was key to. The story. Yeah, the change and adapt. It was a lot of Chris's, Chris Sanders' ideas, but a lot of the Obviously, Dean had input, in, Dean Deblois had input into it, and a lot of the animators, especially Simon Otto and Nico Marley, and some of our character, you know, animators and character designers um, helped to create, you know, what has become the toothless that we all know. <laughs> so, getting to that first premiere. Some of them are better than others. This, this, one was, <laughs> this one was made for the, this is the premiere for the first movie, actually. Yeah. But, um, and this is myself and Cressida at the first movie premiere. 
And what an accomplishment. Now, the success of this, I, I think this film was so pivotal. It, it did, in fact, uh, you, you were talking earlier about Jeffrey Katzenberg holding this concern about the brand, and this film really entrenched that. It just as firmly established DreamWorks as a, a powerhouse. Well, I, I'm proud to say at the end of the day, I think a lot of people feel it's, you know, obviously, you know, we had the Shrek was a huge success for the thing and sort of, you know, DreamWorks hung its hat on that. But I think a lot of, the, I think the Dragon movies are some of the, you know, kind of the most beloved movies of, of, of what DreamWorks, you know, the original version of DreamWorks 1.0 <laughs> uh, did. And, um, you know, and a lot of people, um, a lot of great people contributed to that, you know, all along the way from, you know, the the you know, dean the writer director but, but like i say amazing team of animators and artists and um the production designer and then people outside john powell the, the you know the music for dragon one cannot be topped ever it's just outstanding now this is went on to uh then launch uh, uh, uh here we are again at the premiere yeah, that's the premiere of the first movie with the with the cast who remained really the same for the whole all the you know, Jay Baruchel in America and Joan you know Jonah Hill and everybody. Well, yeah. Good to see you them all. It speaks so well that everyone continues. So it it launched then the uh, the second third. We actually took a trip. This is from our trip. We took a research trip. We we had hoped to do it before the first movie. Didn't get a chance to do it. But this is the key creative team including Roger Deakins, who's on the right, our um, a consulting cinematographer and our editor, um, our, our POV, our production designer. Um, anyway, the, the whole team uh, actually went to Norway and to, to kind of explore the Viking, kind of get inspiration, you know, get inspiration to the Vikings. We, this is the, the, the picture on the right is we took a boat trip in the fjords and kind of get inspiration for that. I mean, I, I know it's just a bird up there flying, but you could imagine that could be a dragon up there. <laughs> but we, but it was very inspirational. We went to the, you know, Viking um, Cultural Museum, the, the Viking Ship Museum. We spent a lot of time talking about, because we did take a, Dean made a major decision on the second movie to take a leap five years forward in the story, which was big. And, um, you know, just to kind of get everybody in sync on what that would, you know, what that would be. Plus the technology was changing and we felt like we could really enhance the look of the movie and make it even more authentic and, um, you know, and riding on the popularity of the first movie, we were, everybody was excited, but we took this great few day trip to Norway uh, to kind of, like I say, get, you know, do some photography and get inspired and um, learn a little bit more about, you know, the Vikings, which is, the interesting part is I think sometimes if you say that, you know, is, is how to train your dragon about Vikings, I'm not even sure most people would even <laughs> make that connection because it, it feels this has this universal quality about it, you know, yeah, um, cool. it could be anywhere, anytime. Right. But it was really the ideas that based on the Viking culture. And that's, that speaks so well to the storytelling. You know, there was a conscious choice to bring in a live action cinematographer. Mm hmm. That had never really been done before, Nan. Well, I think I think um, Dean uh, Dean Deblois and Chris, especially Sanders, the two, two directors starting on the first, wanted some kind of um, really were interested in um, you know having a certain authentic authentic I don't want to say realism but believability to the location, right? And what would that look like? The lighting and you know especially with regard to how it was lit and shot. And we learned, we learned a huge, um, you know, huge, huge amount from, from um, uh, Roger. And he, he get, consulted on all three of the films, honestly. Yeah. But I thought that was, and it just is inspirational to the crew to work with somebody like him, you know, a multiple Academy Award nominee and just general brilliant artist mm -hmm. in his own right, you know. And, and he loved working with all the digital tools and, that animation had to offer. And it just really lends itself to such an epic scope for the mm -hmm. as well. Um, again, another. This is Dragon Two premiere, um, and then um, and yeah, with the some of the cast returning, plus uh, Jaime and Hansu, mm -hmm. who played the villain in the movie. Yeah, great, great another, stuff. And Dean and I, and we uh, our, our 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 moment of glory on the right when we won our Golden Globe for Dragon Two. 
we were so proud that night. Yeah. Dean said I screamed so loud. I was sitting next to him that he was deaf in that ear for a long time afterwards. <laughs> so I, was like, I was so amazed. And this is dra Jump Ahead to Dragon 3. And Crescent again came in to be with us on the left with America and Jerry Butler and Jay. And um, it was, it was, it was, a, it was, it was, um, it was a special day, but kind of, you know, bittersweet knowing that everything was sort of, you know, this would be it for this version, you know, this mm -hmm. versions of the movie basically. But taking a, a Oscar nomination, very exciting. And well yep. That's Dean and I on the left, um, a little Oscar love. And then the middle is Oscar night. Not, not too long ago before things so radically changed in our whole world. <laughs> yes. But, uh, but anyway, we I'm very proud to say all three films were, were nominated. Um, yeah for yeah. Oscars and we, we're very proud of that. Now, that. And speaking of, Bonnie, you for many years have served as one of the lead governors for uh, at, uh, with the Academy in animation and also short subject. Correct? Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm the, I'm the governor for the short films and feature animation branch. I'm the, I'm the chair of that, of that branch right now. And I really, I've enjoyed my, uh, this past year, I was actually also the secretary of the Academy uh, officer. And I did that. Some, you know, met a lot of great people outside of our branch. I do some traveling when I can. Um, I was, I did a um, um, panel over in France, actually in February. Um, got together a group in, with some of our, you know, members in Europe, and then did one in London, um, in Vancouver. So we have members. You know, the the academy is more and more global, and we're, um, you know, trying to reach out. Um, and, and, and work with some of the other organizations like BFI and BAFTA and that I actually served on the BAFTA board and on the PGA board for a while. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm a joiner. I like, you know, I like being part of different organizations. This is a picture of me. I gave the commit. I was very fortunate to give the com uh, commencement speech at Boston University um, where I went to graduate school. This was a couple of years ago. I'm very proud of that moment to be called back for that. Um, and I'm on the, actually on the uh, advisory board for the journalism school at both Annenberg and Boston University. But again, it gives me a chance to be with some of the, know what's going on in the universities, especially here in California and Boston, because I have an affinity to that, because having been a, a you know, an alumni there mm -hmm. um, to work with some of the students. Okay. And this is uh, my, my, my dear uh, mentee, Emily uh -huh. Justo. Um, I started working with her um, uh, when she was a uh, eleventh grader in high school here in Los here in LA through um, Big Brothers and Sisters of Los Angeles and Women in Entertainment, and she is now um, getting ready to graduate from Mount St. Mary's. I'm proud to say I'm so proud of her. Um, she's thinking she wants to go into documentary filmmaking. I'm trying to help her get um, uh, some kind of opportunity, maybe an internship in do in the documentary area. But she's I work you know. Um, I've enjoyed that. And, um, she tells that's exciting. Yeah, she's doing yeah. great. The exciting honors as well. Oh, uh, this is, yeah, this is, I'm very proud of this. I got to meet President Obama. He came to DreamWorks actually um, to tour the studio. This was actually during the making of Dragon 2. So um, he said he was a big fan. He and his family were big fans of Dragon 1. I was so proud. And he loved them. He got to meet some of our crew and see some of the a sneak peek of some of the material ahead of the release of movie two. So that was kind of a what, what very a, special moment for me. I'm very proud. It's very much. Well, you know, your, your work and your career, Bonnie, has been so remarkable. Um, and it's been such a joy getting to explore just even a tiny fraction of it. Oh but, my gosh. There's a lot to cover. <laughs> running I hope it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you can hang on for a few minutes, I'm, I'm wondering if Matt, if we've got any questions, I'd like to get, some of sure questions answered from the chat because I know I've been seeing quite a few go by. Yeah, I guess I'll just go back to the very first question we got um, from Cheryl, who's asking, uh, what do you look for in an animation script that makes you want to say yes to produce it? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's interesting because I think with these days, with all the tools and everything that we can do, uh, the toolbox has just grown so much. I think sometimes it's harder and harder to know what will make a good animated movie. 
Um, but I like to think it's something that will, if it's really a, a feature you're looking for, it's something that will take you into a world that you almost can't experience in live action. Again, that's harder and harder to define these days because you can do so many things in, with visual effects. But I think, you know, especially interesting characters, non-human characters, um, that's, but, but at, the, at the end of the day, I like a story that has a lot, that has some heart, um, that, you know, has some twists and turns and has layers. And that's the kind of things that I personally am attracted to. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. uh, keep going, Matt. I know there have been a, there were a few that went by. Uh, Celine's asking um, that since you went through so many evolutions of the animation medium, what do you think is the future for animation? Oh gosh, I, from what I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm right now I'm actually developing some things independently. I'm excited about that. And the, the, I guess the nice thing is about animation is it feels like, and maybe this is more part of our future, even after thing, we get beyond this moment in, in time, but people can work and, and function just about anywhere, um, which is great. And it, it, you know, the, it allows our industry to become more global. Um, but I think the interesting thing is, I think people are, you know, it used to be, I felt like, it, especially in features, that it kept bigger and better and more and more. But I think the nice thing is there's this, and people like that. They like some of the big features that have, you know, a lot of the effects and all this interesting things like the dragon movies and stuff. And I think they'll never, they'll always be popular. But I like the fact that they're also these small and intimate animation projects that are also very appealing with good storytelling and they may be in 2d and they may be in anime and they may be in these different things but they don't all have to be these giant productions that they can be um you know they can be done in these little small places um all over the world and still be you know good storytelling and some of them they can be adult leaning and some of them can be you know for younger kids and you know um but i think there's some what i'm interested in too is I'm, i think there's uh something in between some of the you know kind of younger tv you know kit tv series for younger kids and some of the big features i think i'm interested in this kind of limited event series and animation but i think you have to have the right material to warrant that to give you something that you can do for you know, over five hours or something. So I'm, I'm have my eyes set on finding the, just the right thing for that and finding somebody who would be willing to invest in something like that. But I love good, like I say, good stories that are complex with interesting characters. And I think that's appealing in live action and animation as well. All right, next question, Matt. This next one's a personal question from Lisa, who's asking, what is, the fav what is your favorite movie that you've worked on and why? Oh gosh. I have, you know, they're, they're different in, um, in, you know, they're all special to me in different ways because of the things I've either learned from them or the experiences I've had. Um, but um, I don't know. It's hard. It's really hard to say. It's really hard to say. I guess, you know, uh, they, like I say, I, it's hard to even pick a favorite. Toy Story was, you know, they're all challenging. I, I'm sure during many of them, I cried many times <laughs> it's because it, they were hard and it was frustrating and whatever. But um, I got a lot of joy out of them because, well, largely because of the people that I've met. So they, it's hard to pick a favorite. They were favorite at the moment for the for things that I, you know, when I was working on them, I was enjoying them. And that was what's important, especially looking back. I appreciate it even more. Keep going, Matt. I know we've got a couple more. <laughs> yeah, this next one from uh, Nathan is asking, when you're looking for new talent, uh, what are some things that stand out to you that you're specifically looking for? You mean to, to you mean, to, I would assume to work, you know, just to work with on, on my team and stuff? I believe so, I yes. I think, yeah. I mean, listen, I think um, uh, I love to give, you know, I love finding people that are really passionate about what, what they do. And, and, and when I meet them and I can tell that they're, you know, they're going to, they're going to work hard and they're not lazy <laughs> because I think when you get into the in, in working in, and I'll call it the film business. I know that that's the, the definition of that is expanded, but you have to be willing to sort of do a little bit of everything. And, um, but you just love the medium and you love storytelling and you love collaborating. 
and um, I, 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 I talk to a lot of students. I talk to a lot of up and coming uh, people that want to get in the business. I've talked to a lot of people that are in the business already that want to make a transition. And um, uh, I think it's exciting to, um, you know, always connect with people that want to learn something new. Um, and, and, you know, like I say, I'm mainly willing to, to work hard, um, you know, until it gets done. Um, this next one from Caroline is asking if you have any educational resources for someone who wants to get into animation production management. Hmm. I'm trying to think how you, how you do that these days. How do you kind of start with the, with it? You know, um, I do know, I do know, and I don't know exactly, but I think there, and I'm not sure what's going on there now, but I know UCLA used to have this continuing education class. It wasn't in, I don't believe it was in animation production management, but it was in production management in their continuing education courses. And I've heard it's very good. And honestly, you know, whether it's live action or animation, it doesn't matter. They teach you the principles of production managing and, um, I think that would be, that's my, my, you know, best idea of somewhere to start. I don't know what the animation schools are offering in that, in that area. Um, some of the studios offer internships. Some of the animation studios used to offer internships um, in different areas where you could, you know, be an intern. That's mostly in, for college students. So I don't know what age you are or what place, you know, what, what step you are. But I think maybe through you, you I would check through UCLA or USC. USC, um, do uh, they have something, Mindy? Uh, they may. Uh, business program uh, classes on uh, the business of animation, and mm -hmm. it, they'll give you, but specific um, production. Yeah, know, it's I, like I say, I know UCLA. Someone told me, you know, that had been an intern at at at, at DreamWorks who had taken this course at US UCLA, and it was very good. Keep an eye out too for workshops, the Animation Guild, and other places. Yeah. Or Women in Animation sometimes has stuff, and they're all a CIFA maybe. Yeah, yeah. Get on. I would suggest getting on those mailing lists and kind of begin attending some of the events when the world allows you to attend, or even the online events, and start uh, networking in in that regard. And and uh, lots of great opportunities there. And I think we've got just a couple more questions there on the chat, Matt, if you want to. Yeah, this next one from Nathan uh, is asking, what was your biggest challenge when moving from live action to animation? Well, in a way, it was the pace. I feel like even though I had worked on features, I felt like animation, I mean, I always say a day in live action is equal to like a week in animation. So I think just getting used to the you still had to set certain deadlines so that you could keep things moving, but everything took, you know, sometimes they say animation is like watching grass grow. <laughs> it's just a little bit longer. And I think getting used to that pace, um, and I obviously had some technical things I had to learn, but I think, listen, I'm not the one that has to do the actual animation myself. So I didn't know how to need to know how to do that. But I think what I had learned was how to work with artists and how to manage artists and understand what that is. And I, I was very lucky on the first movie on Toy Story to work with uh, Joe Ramp, who was the head of anim He was the head of story on on uh, Toy Story One, and he was a seasoned veteran. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away quite young, sadly. But he took me under his wing, and I had to. T I asked him to tell me everything. <laughs> Please show me everything you know about um, animation. And again, it wasn't necessarily in a technical point but just sort of the process and, and the folks at Disney and, and especially Joe Ramped were great at sort of uh, taking me under their wing and showing me, um, you know, uh, learning different things. And because of the, the pace of the movie was kind of so protracted, it gave me time to kind of learn it, but a lot of it was applicable. That's why I had just suggested to the other person that if you learn about general production management, you'll understand it's about managing resources and those resources might be animators. They could be, you know, teamsters, it could be, you know, depending on what, what environment you're in, how do you have to manage certain things on a calendar and get these things made? But, but it's more than this, this, that it's understanding creatively what you're trying to accomplish and know that there uh, sometimes there's steps forward and sometimes there are two steps back before there are more steps forward. And you have to, uh, under, you know, sort of start to learn that and, and, and understand 
when you've been around it enough, you start to understand, oh, this is going to be a problem down the road, and how can we plan for that now? Um, they always said the most valuable time you spend in production is in pre-production, because that's where you try to plan for everything that you know will go wrong, because invariably when you're in production, once production has started, and for, for animation, that's kind of the beginning of layout, something will go wrong invariably that you will have no, you won't even have planned for and that you can't imagine. And then the good news, you'll have, um, um, you know, you'll have planned for the things that you do, you know, will probably happen. And that way you can deal with the things, unexpected things that you won't know will have happened. And one more, Matt, and then. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for our last one, I guess, I'll just go to the next one from Mirai. Yeah. Is asking, would you suggest aspiring producers uh, get any job at a big studio and try to work their way up or to work on independently producing shorts and getting themselves into festivals to gain credits and connections? Well, if there's any way to do both, I suggest that. <laughs> I suggest, I always tell a lot of the students that I talk to, go out and just go to work. If it's at all related, it's good to get your foot in the door because you'll learn a lot and you never know when some opportunity will present itself that you didn't know about. That you see somebody over there doing some job, they go, oh, I didn't even know that existed. And that might be interesting or that person that you meet might introduce you to so-and-so. I think sometimes working independently, you're a little bit sequestered. But if you have a great idea for a short and can pull together the, 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 the financing and the wherewithal to get something done, I, more power to you. But if there's any way, you know, I do feel like exposing yourself to an environment where you're going to meet other people and share ideas and see what's out there is super important to kind of getting started. Terrific. Bonnie, thank you so much. It is oh, thank you, Mindy. Thank you so much to explore just a slice of your incredible talents and your remarkable career. I know we just, believe it or not, scratched the surface. Oh my gosh, you were pretty thorough, Mindy. You did a lot of work. I hope, like I say, I hope people found it informative and interesting, so. Bonnie, this has been incredibly special. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks, Tina. See you guys soon.